There are a few times in the year that a lot of the members here at Wetumpka are involved in a variety of things. Hopefully throughout each week and throughout the year, we're doing a lot of good things in service to the Lord. But, uh, you know, there are, I guess, some occasions that are a little bigger from the standpoint of in January, the church here has an annual family retreat. And uh, it is such a joy. I think the last few years, over a hundred of the members here have been a part of that. Of course, you know, we always miss when members are gone. We always miss when about 40 or more are gone to like polishing the pulpit last week. 40 of the members here, I think is actually a little over 40. But uh, whether it is the church family retreat or polishing the pulpit or church camps that our young people and several of the older ones here are involved in, it is, uh, I believe, something that is very beneficial to those who attend those things. It is a time of spiritual growth. It's a time of fellowship. I will just say on behalf of those who uh, were at the uh, Christian conference uh, polishing the pulpit this last week that over 5,000 individuals from 46 different states and several foreign countries had the opportunity to be together to hear uh, a number of just great Bible lessons that were very edifying, very encouraging. Probably... Um, the highlight, one of the highlights for me was getting to hear our brother Don Blackwell. I forgot what evening he spoke. I was actually at the cabin that night uh, doing some preparation that I need to do for a, a future speaking uh, a class I was going to be teaching, but I got to see him and watch him, uh, Jan and I did online, and it was such a blessing to also hear in our 8.30 period that brother Don Blackwell, who four months ago was in an ATV accident uh, with from the waist down that only four months ago that happened and then to think that he is uh, preaching the gospel in front of literally thousands of people in person and uh, I think at least about a thousand people online that he's able to do that and give God the glory. And when you see that kind of spiritual strength in people, it is quite edifying, encouraging and will help us just to keep on keeping on in this life regardless of the circumstances, and then to not only hear that he was preaching the gospel and to be able to witness him preaching the gospel, but then to know that he's back home teaching people the gospel who are working on his house so that his house can become more wheelchair friendly. And uh, brethren, it's just a continual always onward and upward. I will say it's also great to have our visitors here. I know we have some, the Bridges from Cottondale, great to have you here today. We also have David Gray back with us. We just saw David up in Tennessee at Polishing the Pulpit. He's a, a student, a full-time student at the Southeast School of Biblical Studies, the preaching school there, and we are just excited for what the Lord is doing through him. It is such a pleasure to be together. I appreciate Brent and Jason over the last uh, few weeks teaching on and preaching on elders and deacons, and it is, uh, it is going to be a pleasure here in a week or two to be able to put a few names before the church here for your consideration as a potential elder and deacons. And so I hope that you will be thinking about that, praying about that. And uh, we are just so thankful, brothers and sisters. It, it's, it's a little piece of heaven on earth every time God's people come together. And when God comes together and we're able to come together unity based upon truth, what a blessing it is, Psalm 133 verse 1, for his brethren to dwell together, for our brethren to dwell together in unity. It's a blessing when thousands of people can come together to hear truth preached and to dwell together in unity. And it will be a blessing one day. All of our struggles in this life, all of our uh, persevering through hard times will be worth it when we are one day dwelling together in eternal life with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If you can see the screen here behind me, you'll notice that we're talking about a subject that I actually had the opportunity to speak on this last week at Polishing the Pulpit. And uh, it's a subject that you think, well, you know, we don't really have a lot of problem with this. Maybe, maybe we do, maybe we don't. But I will say it's interesting, given the day and time in which we live, when there are so many people who would actually admit to struggling with dishonesty. 
There was a study done by the University of Massachusetts a few years ago in 2002 in which 60% of people lied at least once during a 10-minute conversation and told an average of two to three lies during that period. According to a 2007 study by Scientific American, 90% of people attempting to find a date online lie. So if you do any online dating, hey, that, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you do, just be aware that there is a lot of dishonesty online. 90% of people attempting to find a date online lie. You know, Nahum, in his prophecy against, uh, the, uh, against Nineveh, back around, I guess that would be well several centuries ago, but it was after Jonah, because you remember that Jonah went into Nineveh to preach a message of repentance, and they, re, they repented. But then about a hundred years later, Nahum comes along, and in chapter 3 and verse 1, he refers to that city which is now backslid back into sin, calls them a city that is full of lies. And eventually you recall that they were destroyed. I'm not so sure that the day and time in which we live and the culture in which we live, that it is a, really all that different than some of the dishonest cultures that we've seen in times past. Given that to be the case, do you think that the Lord's church, that individual Christians, that moms and dads and kids, that we need to seriously consider our view toward just truth and honesty and whether or not as we evaluate our lives, whether or not we are engaging in some dishonest um, conversations or wordings of things or writings of things. It's interesting to me that this was a problem even in the first century, uh, considering how many times the New Testament writers warn churches, as Landon just read for us a few minutes ago, to put away lying. That was in uh, the letter to the church at Ephesus in uh, Colossae there, the church uh, at Colossae, when Paul wrote to them the epistle that we call Colossians, uh, he says there in chapter 3 that they were to you know, put away lying as well. They were to die to it as they were to die to all their old sins as they are people who have risen to walk a new life. You know, as we read through the Bible, there should just be example after example of us warning us about not being dishonest and helping us to see the importance of, of being honest. As you go through just the book of Genesis, think about how the serpent told a lie, right, to Eve. You shall not surely die if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 4, uh, Cain said when God approached him about where is your brother, he said what? Am I my brother's keeper? I don't know where he is. Did He, know, he knew at least where his body was. Or how about Isaac over there uh, further in about uh, Genesis chapter 26 when he was going down among the Philistines around Gerar and he said that his wife was his sister because he was afraid for his life. Or how about in the next chapter when, when um, not Isaac but his son, his son Jacob, his mother tells him that he needs to go and get the, the blessing from his father Isaac because he's going to give it to Esau. And so his mother schemes along with Jacob to, to take the blessing that was supposed to be for Esau. Even went so far, as you recall, to kill a goat and to put the, the hair of the goat on his hands and on the back of his neck. You want to talk about some uh, lying deceit there. And then just to tell his father just very forthrightly that he is Esau. That I, Jacob said, am Esau. Jacob got a little taste of his own medicine a few years later when one of the most low-down lies in Scripture is told by his sons in knowing that Joseph was sold to the Midianites, also known as the Ishmaelites, who then took him down to Egypt. But his brothers told their father Jacob what? Oh, that some wild animal had eaten him. Can you imagine? I mean, I just can't imagine any of our young people not only, not only not selling their brother as much as, Brooke, you might want to sometimes, I know. Maybe that was back in the past, right? Not so much now. Maybe, maybe not selling your, your brother into to slavery, but, but then they would lead their father for years and years and years to believe that, that he was dead and that he had been eaten by a wild animal. 
You can go throughout the Scriptures. What about Samson whose name is mentioned in Hebrews 11 in the great chapter on faith? Samson lied to Delilah three times. Samson was not only unwise at times, he just just straight up lied at times. Three times he was asked, you know, where did his strength come from? Did he have to tell Delilah anything? Couldn't he have just said, it's none of your business? Couldn't he have just said, you know, it's not really my place to tell you that? He could have said a number of things, but three times he lied. And then, in all of his foolishness, wound up just telling her where his strength actually came from. There are a lot of lies that are told in Scripture. And maybe a point we'll make a little bit later as well. Not every time someone tells a lie in Scripture, do the Bible writers inspired by the Holy Spirit, did they stop and say, well, this was a blatant lie. They just told the account of the events that are going on. They didn't stop always any more than they did every time a righteous individual did something heroic, uh, courageous, or virtuous, or righteous. Not every time someone does something right or wrong, does the Bible writer stop and say, well, you know, this was a right thing that he did. Or you know, this was a wrong thing that they did. And sometimes because the Bible writers don't stop, some people assume, well, well, they lied in this situation, so maybe it's okay for us to lie today. I suppose the most foundational truth for this subject, and I, I would contend perhaps almost any subject. I mean, maybe the most foundational truth of just our Christian lives, perhaps it just begins with this, that God is truth. And you might say, well, Eric, I thought it was that God is love or God is grace or God extends grace to us or God gives us salvation. through All that is true. That's right. But guess what? It's true. That is, the only way we know to believe that is because it's, it's true. That is, our God is a God of truth. Listen, if we thought that God could lie sometimes, then how would we ever know what He said was right and what He said wasn't like, right? And He was just trying to make us believe something that's not true. The fact that God is true really is the foundation of everything in our lives. It's the foundation for us to be true, for us to be honest about everything. Because God is true. The, the Bible records numerous times about things that are true about God. His word is true. His works are true. His commandments are true. His ordinance are true. The psalmist says a lot of things about God being true. Everything about God is true. When Jesus came to earth, what did Jesus say? He said in John chapter 8 verse 14, I bear witness of myself and my witness is true. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth. Everything about Je Jesus is true. Everything about God, about the Father, about the Holy Spirit is true. And so if we want to be like God, we're going to be truthful. We're going to be honest all day, every day. Oh, we make mistakes and sometimes we sin. We ought to confess that sin, repent of that sin. But as far as the standard, God is the standard. Everything about God Everything about God is true. Whereas everything about Satan is what? Well, what was it? What is it that John chapter 8, verse 44 tells us? That there's no truth in him. He's a liar and the father of it. So, whereas Satan condones dishonesty and lying, God sets the perfect example for us in telling the truth. Think about Jesus' ministry. Can you imagine how many times when all of his enemies were attempting to entangle him in his talk, trying to trap him, entrap him, catch him off guard, get him in trouble with the Roman authorities or the Jewish authorities? Can you imagine how many times? Well, he was tempted in all points just as we are. You wonder if there was a moment of temptation where he was tempted to be dishonest. Would we? I would be. I would be tempted in all of those kinds of scenarios that he found himself in to just not only be dishonest, but sometimes just be mean. I think I would be tempted to respond in hateful ways. Jesus is the perfect example of teaching, but before that, he's just the perfect example of truth. You know, the Bible tells us that we are to call upon him in truth, Psalm 145, verse 18. We are to serve him in sincerity and truth. Joshua 24, 14, John 4, 23 and 24, right? We are to worship Him in spirit and in truth. The Hebrews writer says, let us draw near to Him with a true 
heart, everything about God is true. And God consistently commends honesty. Now, I know this is, a, this is Bible 101, right? This is Bible 101. We get this. And before, but before we get to some of the other supplemental points in this lesson, let's just lay down first and foremost that, hey, God wants His people to be true and He consistently commends honesty. Proverbs 11 and verse 1, Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 22, Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who deal truthfully are His Delight. Oh, that's sweet, isn't it? Those who deal truthfully are His delight. Let me tell you some of my... One of the reasons I just love Wetumpka so much and love this congregation is because I believe that we are a people, that we are trying to be people who are true and who are honest. One of the reasons I love to work with Mark and Nelson so much is because these are men of integrity. One of the reasons I love the ministers of this congregation, Jason and Brent and Rob, because these are men of integrity. Don't we want those kinds of examples in our lives? Don't we want to be around people like that? Don't we want you know, to sh sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron with truth? Even sometimes when truth hurts, whatever things Paul said are true, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Not just true. I know there's true and noble and just and pure and lovely and good report. But number one, those things that are true, think on these, on these things. Brothers and sisters, a good marriage, the foundation of a good marriage is truth, honesty. The foundation of, I believe, number one, of just being a good Christian man or woman, young man or young woman, is being true, true to yourself, true to myself, true to our God, true to our brothers and sisters in Christ. We see where God consistently commends honesty and condemns dishonesty. We see this throughout Scripture. It is a continual, it is a, a continual, uh, consistent condemning of dishonesty. Maybe that's because God, maybe there's, there is so much emphasis put on it because God knows that it can be a grave temptation. If Satan is a liar, the father of it, there's no truth in him, do you think that Satan seriously tempts people? And we're living in a day and time again where so many people around us, they think so very little of telling a little white lie, telling a fib, lying. And so I believe it's something where we need to try to insulate ourselves with this truth so that we don't ever rationalize being a dishonest person and, and lying. Turn, if you will, to Jeremiah. I want you to see what Jeremiah had to say about Jerusalem and Judah in, in his day. Jeremiah chapter 9. I'm just going to read a few verses here. Notice this scathing rebuke upon those in Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 3. Um, he said that he might weep day and night over them and over this. Chapter 9, verse 1, verse 3. And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They, have, they are not valiant for the truth on the earth. Do we want to be valiant for the truth? That's what God wants us to be. For they proceed from evil to evil. And they do not know me, says the Lord. Everyone take heed to his neighbor. And do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant what does that idea supplant come from? Well, no doubt from Jacob supplanting Esau. That's a part of what his name means. And stealing the blessing that was given to his, that was supposed to be given to his brother. Verse 5, everyone will deceive his neighbor and will not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. Verse 6, your dwelling place is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit they refuse to know me. Verse 8, their tongue speaks deceit. Verse 9, shall I not punish them for these things? This is a scathing rebuke on a people who should have known better. And you recall, as Brother Terry teaches uh, from 
Revelation chapters 1 through 3 in our Sunday morning auditorium class. If you're not making it for Bible study, I sure hope you would reconsider coming in. You're, it's a great class, learning a ton of stuff. He reminded us this morning about Ananias and Sapphira. When they sold their property, they could have done whatever they wanted to with that money, but they gave half, half of it, laid it at the apostles' feet, a portion of it, and then they led them to believe all that they gave it all. And you recall how serious that God was about that sin. Lying to the Holy Spirit, God struck them dead. And I believe it's twice there in Acts chapter 5 where, where Luke tells us in Acts that great fear came upon the church. You know, that was a tragic incident, but was it good for the church to be reminded about how serious the sin of lying is? Lying is always wrong. Even if we think we're doing it for a good reason, lying is always wrong. What do you say when someone comes up to you at school, maybe, or maybe at work, or somewhere out to eat, and you're, you're not saving this seat for someone else, but someone comes next to you that maybe you don't really want to sit next to, and they say, is this seat saved? And maybe you're tempted to say, uh-huh, when it's not. Or... Maybe if we think we're doing it for a good cause, you know, a few years ago, well, I guess it was several years ago now because I'm 43 and got gray hair coming in like crazy, but I think I was a senior in high school when I was taking a class on a shorthand. It was basically a note-taking class. It was like a nine-week or maybe, a, I don't know how, how many weeks it was, kind of short course. And it was, you know, learning to basically take notes quickly. They thought it would help us in college, and maybe it did, I don't know. But I remember there was a young man who sat next to me, a friend of mine, real super nice guy, but he was a little, he struggled with academics quite a bit, it seemed, and he seemed to be just a little slower. And I remember that the teacher used to have us swap papers to grade, and I would have to grade his paper a lot. And I remember how much it crushed me having to mark off question after question after question that he got wrong. And so you know what I was tempted to do, and you know what I did? I just didn't mark about half of the ones wrong that should have been wrong because I thought I was, I was helping him. I thought I was helping him get through school. Until my teacher told me otherwise, when she asked in front of the whole class, who graded this boy's paper? And I said, I did. And there was a lesson for me there. We can be honest and be kind. We can be kind and be honest, but we ought to be careful rationalizing lying because lying is always wrong. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Kings. 2 Kings, there is an interesting story there where the Syrians are wanting to defeat, defeat Israel and they are wanting to, to basically... Uh, catch the Israelites off guard, if you will. They want to capture them. They want to defeat them. But every time they think that, the king of the Syrians think that, 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 that we're going to get them, if you will. Well, the is, Israel's not there. And he's like, What's, he thinks that, was well, there someone in my midst, someone in my camp who's telling them, you know, where we're going to be? And his men say, no, this is the prophet who basically knows what you say in your tent. Of course, God would give him that ability, right? Who then tells the king of Israel, there the capital city being Samaria, where you're going to be, so they avoid that area. And the text says this didn't happen just once or twice. It seemed like this happened a number of times. And so the king of Syria sends a great army down to Dothan to surround the city of Dothan where Elisha is. And this is where the text picks up in verse... Verse 18, so when the Syrians came down to him, so they came down to the city of Dothan after they had camped outside of the city the night before, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people, I pray with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And then this is what Elisha said. What about Elisha's deception here? Elisha said, this is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. You know, it is appropriate to go through the Scriptures and say, this is what God commends. He commends honesty and He condemns dishonesty. But I think it's also helpful, especially in this day and time of doubt, where so many individuals 
are, well, where non-religion is the fastest growing quote-unquote religion in the world, where so many people bring up passages like this to say, well, well, Christian, what about this? Is it okay to do this? Was Elisha right in what he did? And so it, it's not really appropriate for us to just skirt past these passages or try to ignore them and not talk about some passages that are somewhat difficult. What Elisha said here should be examined, but there are really just two points I want to make about Elisha. And that is, if Elisha lied, he was wrong. If Elisha lied, he was wrong. After reading through this several times, I'm not convinced that he did or didn't. I'm not really sure. I tend to lean toward he didn't, but I don't know because there's so very little that we have about this conversation. But if he did lie, he was wrong. Now, did, did any of the brave souls, courageous souls, godly people in the past, did they ever lie? Well, yeah. We already, we already went over some of those. Did, did Moses ever do anything wrong? Did Noah ever do anything wrong? Sure. So there are moments in even the best of people's lives, I mean, as they serve Jehovah God, that sometimes they do something wrong, and yet the text doesn't stop to tell us that they did something wrong. It just describes the events. So it could be that what Elisha did here, it could be that he, that he told a lie. I'm not really sure. I, I seem to, to uh, veer toward, lean toward another explanation, and that is perhaps... He deceived an enemy in an authorized manner. Again, the, the, um, the statement in question is 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 19. Elisha said to them, This is not the way, nor is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. Now, maybe they, maybe they never said, Well, we're seeking Dothan. I mean, they were already outside of Dothan. They went down into Dothan. And so when Elisha said... Um, you're seeking another city. And I'm going to take you to the man whom you're seeking. Well, when he went into, he took them to Samaria. That's where he wanted them to be. And then he revealed himself to them in Samaria, and they were seeking him. So I don't know that it is necessarily a lie to say, well, um, yeah, I'm going to reveal the person that you're seeking, but he just chose to reveal himself to them a little while later. Whether Elisha lied or not, I think we might be able to disagree about that. But we can't use this passage to say, well, it's okay for us to lie at some point in time that we think we need to lie. Could it be that Elisha, that he deceived the enemy in an authorized manner? As we always need to do, we need to define our terms. And we need to look at lying. To lie, and I believe this is an adequate definition by Webster, is to make an untrue statement with the intent to deceive. One of the Greek words that is used for lying is pseudos, which is a lie. Conscious and intentional falsehood. It's a lie. Conscious and intentional. You know, you might say, well, if I say, uh, uh, Slater, what are you having for lunch today? And Slater says, well, I'm having pig in the blankets back at grandma's house. Well, he thinks that he's having pig in the blankets, but it could be that, they, that he goes to grandmother's house and actually... They're having tacos. But he thought it was picking up. Now, has he lied about that? No, he, he, maybe he saw his grandmother, you know, with hot dogs and some bread, and he just got, he thought it was picking the blankets. Okay, obviously that little illustration there just off the top of my head. But, you know, sometimes we may say something, and we think that this is what, you know, it's going to be, but we're honestly wrong about it. There's not this intent to lie so to lie is, again, to make an untrue statement with the intent to deceive. A lie, conscious and intentional falsehood. While all lying is a form of deception and sinful, not all deception is lying. So this is a, this is a critical point. And if we're going to be thorough with this subject matter, I think it would be appropriate for us to just consider the fact that all lying is wrong, all lying is sinful. But not all... And, and see... It might look kind of odd to see this on the screen and to hear this. But then once you start rolling out with a number of examples, then you're like, oh, well, okay, I got you. You know, Norman Dean is a football coach. And for years, I remember when he was coaching at Elmore County, you know, their, their offense had plays and it would be like, some, who's got the ball? I mean, they were running so fast and running this way and that way. If a coach has a play of a fake handoff in a game, has he lied? Because there was a fake. Does he? Does the coach want the other team to think that the running back has the ball going this way, but then he's going really that way? 
a different running back. Or maybe the quarterback keeps it. And he's, we call that a fake handoff, but that's not a lie. If uh, in basketball someone does a no-look pass, you know, they want the defender to think they're going to pass it this way, but they're passing it that way. It's not a lie. Is it a form of deception? It is. All lying is deception and all lying is sin, but not every single form of deception. Well, let me just tell you what happened to me this morning. Put on this red shirt or whatever the color this is. I think it used to be red. I think it's pink now because it's several years old. I noticed there were a few wrinkles on this shirt. So you, I'm just giving this away now, okay? So I decided I'm going to wear a tie to cover the wrinkles. This is between the tie and the jacket. I think I've pretty much covered it. I didn't want you, now I've given it all away, I didn't really want you to know the shirt had wrinkled, but now you all know. So was me putting on a tie, and if that was my main motivation for that, was that a form of deception? It, it, it is. Just like, with all due respect and love in my heart for all of the men and women here today, if you wear hair coloring because you don't want people to see your gray hair, and, you know, there is a sense in which, isn't that right, Dad? Can I get an amen on that, Dad? Because if I recall correctly, I think you used to call out Mom for a few years when she would put some hair coloring on, right? And now put your hand around and hug her now, okay. <laughs> now, is that a form of deception? Sure. But it's not lying. Now, if someone, if I were wearing hair coloring, and obviously I don't, but if, if I was wearing it and someone came up to me and said, Eric, do you wear color on your hair? Now, if I were to say at that point, no, I don't, and I do, well, what would that be? Well, that would be a lie. So there are, if you will, forms of deception. In, in, in war, obviously, if a soldier puts his hat on a stick and, you know, puts it up in the air to see if the enemy is going to shoot the hat, is that, a, is that lying? No. But is it a form of deception? If, uh, if, if someone in the military wears the enemy's uniform... And I've never been in the military, okay? But, you know, to, to try to sneak in and do this or do that, is that a form of deception? Yes. Is it a lie? No. Now, it could be if someone then says, well, you know, I'm, I am this person or that person and it's totally a lie. I'm just saying, all lying is sinful. And the Scriptures, I can find nowhere in Scripture where the Bible says, well, it's okay for you to lie in this situation or that situa situation. However... I think it is a healthy distinction, and really when we think about it, a very obvious distinction that not everything, whether it be in sports or in war or parenting. How many times maybe a child asks, a young child asks a parent a sensitive question that that child is not ready to hear the answer to yet, and the parent um, deceives them in a, an appropriate, righteous manner by distracting them or doing something else. In fact, I have a few things up here regarding deception. Not revealing everything you know is not lying. So if a child asks a parent, well, I want to know about this, and you think, well, you're not ready to know about this. Maybe you don't tell the child that yet, but you distract them, or you just don't reveal everything you know. You realize that, that God is all-knowing. He knows everything. Has God revealed everything to us? No. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29. God has told us what He wants us to know. When Abraham, on two occasions, in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 20, when he went down among the Egyptians and then on another occasion among the Philistines, and he was scared for his life and Sarah's life, and he said, Sarah, who was his wife and also his half-sister, when he said, tell them you are my sister, and that's what she told them, uh, he thought, so that they would not kill Abraham, because if he said she was or she said he was her husband, he was afraid they would kill him and take her as their or his, whoever would, whether it was Pharaoh or Abimelech or whoever it was, to take her as their wives and kill Abraham. Well, on two, two occasions, Abraham said, this is my sister, or she said, my brother, uh, likewise. So, is that a lie? Well, I don't believe it's a lie because they were half-brothers and sisters. But is it quite possible, and in my judgment, do I think there was something wrong there? Yeah, I think... It seems to me that Abraham was being cowardly there. If God had made a promise that he was going to bless the world through his seed, 
then he should have been confident that God was going to take care of both him and Sarah. And he didn't need to say that, need, need to put her life, if you will, in jeopardy and act in somewhat of a cowardly way. All that said, I can't say that Abraham was lying there. Was it true? Was it a true statement for Abraham to say, this is my sister? Or for her to say, this is my brother? That was a true statement. Listen, when you marry your half-brother, half-sister, you married your brother or sister. I mean, you know, that's... Some of you here today have half-brothers and half-sisters. And oftentimes, it's just they're just referred to as brothers and sisters. And so... Let's be careful this morning not to ever rationalize lying and being dishonest. Never. Never okay. But at the same time, if we're going to be thorough with this subject, let's just consider the fact that not all deception is lying. Let's see if we can go there to the next point. Diverting one's intention is not lying. If a a robber came into my house and I wanted to try to get away or get my family out of the house, you know what I might do? Hey, what's that over there? (laughs) Hey, did y'all hear something? You know, I'm going to say things. I'm going to try to distract them. Am I going to say, am I going to tell a lie? I hope not. It would be wrong for me to tell a lie. But are there things we can say or do that might be identified or defined as deceptive, but not be dishonest? Uh, Next slide, if we can. I think our clicker has stopped working. Uh, outwitting an enemy is not lying. You know when, you remember the story, do you not, there of, um, of Gideon in Judges chapter 7 where he had all of these men, 32,000 men, to go and fight the Midianites who had 135,000 men and God said, you got too many men, Gideon. And so all those who were afraid, they sent them home, 22,000 men, left them with 10,000. 10,000 versus, I believe it was 135,000. And then there was this interesting test and he said, okay, I want you to take them all down. They're going to get a drink of water and whoever laps water like a dog, they are not there to go on home. And those who cup their hand and bring the water up to their mouths, that's going to be your army. Army, And there were 300 of them. 300 to go and fight the Midianites. And you recall the God approved God's plan for how you're going to defeat the Midianites. He said, I want you to take a trumpet. All of you take a trumpet, take a pitcher and a, uh, not a picture, but a pitcher, P-I-T-C-H-E-R. And I want you to take a torch. And then you're going to go down among the Midianites and uh, at a certain point you're going to shout, you're going to blow the trumpet, you're going to break the pitchers and you're going to have the lights. What was that seemingly obviously meant to do? To make the Midianites think what? That there was a great army around them. But there really wasn't. Let's look at another. I think I have another example. Well, notice some of the verses from Luke and John I mentioned here. I'm not going to take the time to read all these. But you, you remember those occasions when Jesus' enemies were ready to take Him. They wanted to take Him. In Luke chapter 4, what did they, they wanted to throw Him off a cliff. And you recall there were times when the Bible says that Jesus passed among the midst of them. Did Jesus seemingly try to blend in with His surroundings to not be seen by these potential captors who were trying to arrest Him before it was His time, if you will? Yeah, I'm not saying that Jesus never lied. Jesus is 100% honest. God, Titus chapter 1 verse 2, cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18, it's impossible for God to lie. He doesn't lie. There is nothing dishonest about God. But is there... Such a thing as God-approved deception, there certainly seems to be. Consider in 1 Samuel chapter 16, where God tells the prophet Samuel to go and anoint the future king of Israel. Who's going, you know, Saul is no longer going to be the king before long. It's going to be one of the sons of Jesse. And you recall that Samuel was concerned about, well, what if King Saul hears that I'm going to go and anoint the next king of Israel? What, what, what is he going to do? He's concerned for his life. And so this is what God tells Samuel to do. He says in verse 2, when Samuel asked, Well, how can I go if Saul hears it? He's going to kill me. He will kill me. But the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. So this is a God-approved 
way not to lie, but simply not to tell everything you know. I would encourage us not to tell everything we know all the time. Some people call that verbal vomit. It's unnecessary. You don't, it, listen, if you think my breath stinks this morning because I did not eat breakfast, I had a cup of coffee, I did brush my teeth, at least I think I did, okay? Um, and you say, well, Eric, you know, there might be a better, there might be a way. You might say, well, Eric, would you like a breath mint? You don't have to say, rude, your breath stinks this morning. You don't necessarily have to say everything you think. And God has, I believe, given us divine approval here for when our motivations... Now this, to me, brothers and sisters, is very key. When our motivations are honorable, when our motivations are God-approved, it may be that we are a part of some kind of righteous deception. But I think it's very important as we think about this topic as much as in a whole way as we can. Examining not just, let's not be dishonest, let's be honest. What about some of these difficult passages like 1 Samuel chapter 16 or Judges chapter 7 or 2 Kings chapter 6 with Elisha and the Syrian army? Let's consider the fact that whatever we do and whatever we say, our motives matter, right? I mean, can you tell the truth and be sinning? Certainly you can. Because there may be truths that you don't need to repeat. Sometimes that's called slander or gossip. Are there truths that can be said that are unnecessary, that can cause unnecessary commotion and division in churches? Yeah. Yeah. We don't need to say everything we think, but we need to always, we need to always be truthful. You know, there in Matthew chapter 6, God tells us, verses 1 through 18, you can pray, you can do charitable deeds, and you can fast. But if you do those things, and if your motivation is, I want to be seen by men, I want to have the praise of men, then there's no eternal uh, reward or any God approval that's going to be given toward that kind of action. It matters what our motives are. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Listen, you can give your body to be burned. You can have so much faith that you could remove a mountain. But if you don't have love, it's nothing. It profits us nothing. So I would contend, whereas a parent might righteously not tell a child everything the child might want to know at a particular time in life because the child doesn't need to know it, I would, I would caution and I would plead with our young people especially to not take this idea of possible righteous deception to the point of, oh, I can deceive my parents because that's not what the Scriptures teach at all. I mean, think about a parent who says to the child, listen, because of the evil influence this person or this group of young people are upon you, I forbid you to you know, hang around that child for the time being because I'm concerned that they are causing you to do and think all sorts of wicked, sinful things. So let's say that a child hears that, and then a child goes out the next day and hangs out with all these people. And the child comes home, and the mom and dad say, where have you been? And you know in the back of your mind, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to be with this group. I was with them, but I was also with these other people. I'm just going to tell them that I was only with... I'm just going to tell them I was with Joe and Bob, but not, oh, this guy over here who's not doing very good things, and my parents don't want me around them. Is that righteous deception? Absolutely not. The motives in that kind of deception are evil. Whether it is a sinful lie or not, it is sinfully motivated. So we have to, I believe, not only think about lying and truth-telling and honesty and dishonesty and deception, we've got to remember that motives play a huge role here. In just the last few minutes, I'm not going to spend much time on this point because a couple of years ago, I dealt some with this point in the lesson, so I'm going to kind of hurry through this one. Some people say, well, Eric, what about there in Joshua chapter 2 where Rahab lied to the Jerichoan king's men who came to our house and basically were inquiring about where these Israelites were who came into the city. And they were informed that they were at, they were at Rahab's house. And Rahab lied and said that they weren't there and that they had already gone out when in fact they actually were there. Now... Did she lie? Yes. Did she, um, 
Did she say something that was untrue? Yes. And some might say, well, Eric, why does the New Testament commend her? Why, why, do, why do we read over in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Or why is it that, that James recorded us in James chapter 2? Was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Well, again, keep in mind, God's commendation of a righteous act is not approval of anything else. There was no statement in Hebrews or in James, there is no statement that says God approved of her lying. Any more than when Peter, we talked about this in the auditorium class a few weeks ago when uh, Brother Terry was gone and I filled in for him. You remember that, that Lot is called righteous Lot three times in 2 Peter? You turn back to Genesis and you're like, righteous Lot? I mean, he chose to live near the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he chose to offer his daughters to these wicked men of Sodom in hopes of, you know, not allowing his honored guests to be taken up by them and um, abused by them. And then, and then later, his uh, daughters get him drunk and they sleep with... I mean, where is Lot righteous? Well... We can rest assured if the New Testament calls Lot righteous, he was a righteous man. But he was a righteous man who did some things that were incorrect, that were sinful, that were not right. But generally speaking, it seems that Lot was a righteous man because Peter says so by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 2. I believe it's verses 6 through 8 there. Furthermore, when you go back to Genesis chapter 19, you see that even the people there in Sodom knew that Lot had a righteousness about him because they said, you, you're always judging us, Lot. So simply because there is a commendation in the New Testament of something someone does in the Old Testament doesn't mean that the commendation is about everything the person did. And I would contend for us to consider the fact that, I mean, Rahab was a Canaanite harlot. I mean, I don't know if there are any other... Bible men or women who are repeatedly called what Rahab is. I mean, whether it's in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. She's the harlot, the harlot, the harlot, the harlot. She was a Canaanite harlot. And the Canaanites were extremely wicked people. That's why God was expelling them from the land. They were extremely wicked. And she was coming out of this background. And so she was emerging as a person of faith, but she was not perfect or mature in her faith. She was a woman in transition from being a pagan harlot to being a follower of the Lord. I know our time is almost up this morning as we begin to wind down. But let me just say there in Joshua chapter, in Joshua chapter 2, notice all of the, the good things that, that Rahab did. Was she courageous in hiding the spies? Couldn't she have just said, no, get out of here. I don't want anything to do with y'all. No, she courageously hid the spies. Did she treat them kindly or unkindly? Well, she treated them, she, she treated them kindly. She helped them to escape. She not only helped them to escape, but then she told them at the escape that this is what you need to do for a few days so that you do not get caught. And then you recall that she did what the spies told her to do, and that is to not tell anyone and to put this scarlet cord out her window so that would be the sign that, that her household would not be destroyed. So there were many reasons to commend Rahab, but I see nowhere in Scripture where we could say we should commend her because she was dishonest. Her dishonesty is never, never condoned. And as we close, let's just ask this question. But wait a minute, what if we could save a life by lying? I mean, isn't that honorable to want to save a life? Well, sure, that's, it's honorable to want to save a life. It's honorable to not murder, right? It's honorable to be courageous and, and want to help someone. And, but number one, let's ask ourselves this. How could we ever know? We're not omniscient. How could we ever know that if I lie, I'm going to save a life? You think, well, I'm in this you know, scenario that oftentimes gets brought up in this conversation, 
that I don't know I've ever heard of, but maybe it's happened sometime throughout history where a, a murderer comes into your house, gentlemen, and, and he wants to know, you know, are your wife and kids in the house? And you may be thinking, well, if I tell him, yes, they are, then he's going to kill them. Number one, you don't know that that's what would happen. Number two, we don't know the future, but why do we think we have to necessarily say anything at all? Why does an intruder into my house, a potential intruder, why does he have any right to know anything, I think? Sometimes I think in this discussion it gets lost that if someone asks us a question, that means we have to answer it. Now, kids, if your mom and dad ask a question by the fact that they have authority over you and children are to obey their parents and the Lord, we have, as children, the right to to obey them. We are to obey them. But not everyone has a right to everything I think, do, or say, right? So if a man comes breaks and he breaks in my house and he says, I want to know this, this, and that, it would be quite appropriate to say, I'm not telling you anything. Some of you might say it'd be quite appropriate to shoot his kneecaps. Maybe, maybe, anyway, I'm just saying, he doesn't have a right to know what I think. Now, maybe I'll just start preaching the gospel to him and he might scare him out of the house. I don't know. But I'm going to protect the two family members I have left in my house, Jason. I'm going to protect them with my life. My wife and my daughter. Bo and Micah, they can fend for themselves. They left. They're gone. (laughs) I would die for them. I mean, I know it's easier said than done. I get it. I believe I'm in the midst of a number of men who would die for their wives and kids. No question. But you know what we can't do? What if the, what if the robber says, the murderer, potential murderer, what if he says, I want you, here I brought an idol with me. You fall, I heard you're a Christian. You fall down and worship that idol or I'm going to kill your family. Don't ever do that. I don't care whatever in good intentions we have. We never have a right to sin. And if we go through the Christian life thinking, well, in this situation, I might sin in that situation. And I might sin over here in that if, if I needed to. No. Sin is terrible. It's what separates us from God. Even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when it was either their lives or fall down and worship an idol, they said, you know, if God wants to save us from that fiery pit, He can. But if He doesn't, God is good. I mean, in essence, I'm summarizing there the statements in Daniel chapter 3. We never have a right to fall down and worship an idol. What if someone broke into our house and said, okay, I brought this woman. I want you to commit sexual immorality with her. I'm going to kill your kids. No, I'm not going to do that. And guess what? I'm going to try everything I can lawfully do to protect my family. But I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to worship an, an idol I'm not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to go rob a bank and try to get you a million dollars. All these hypothetical scenarios. And again, I find it interesting that it's always, people are always looking for these kind of, I mean, for the most part, just hypothetical scenarios to almost find a way to what? Just to kind of do what we want to do in a particular situation that we might find ourselves. Let's be honest. Let's be pure. Let's be God's people. And we don't know the future, so let's just pray. Let's pray ahead of time for prevention. But even when we're in situations that are quite dire, let's pray that God helps us find a way of escape, right? Do we trust God? Do we love Him? Whether in life or in death, God is good. And as Brother Terry reminded us this morning as he was talking a little bit about the church at Smyrna, a persecuted people, a persecuted people who were in, living in a day of great tribulation, Jesus said to them, not lie when it's convenient, but He said, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. May God help us to be people who are true, who are honest through and through. God will be glorified and I believe His church will be strengthened. This morning, if you're not a Christian, the greatest truth you can ever say is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one who gives us hope. He's the one who gives us eternal life. And based upon that confession, that truth that we know to be true, we're we're going to see the, the importance and the necessity of repenting of sins and being immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Won't you confess Jesus Christ today on your way to becoming a Christian? If you 
are a Christian and you realize, you know what, I, I haven't been a very honest person. I've rationalized lying. I've been deceiving in unrighteous ways. And, and I'm, I'm through with that wicked, sinful, dishonest life. Maybe you can make a change today. God pleads with you to make a change. Let's be true. Let's be honest. Let's be like our God, who is an awesome God. If you need to respond this morning, won't you do so as we stand?